appreciate it and come with a lot of uh, knowledge and experience. We look, we hope you'll come back and participate in future uh, hearings. Uh, and please give uh, my personal regards to Secretary Peters and her team there back at DOT. Be my privilege. Thank you. I will now call up our second panel. Um, this is uh, Mr. Stuart C. Myers and Mr. Bruce E. Stangle from the Association of American Railroads. Uh, and Mr. Thomas D. Crowley and James E. Hodder, representing the Western Coal Traffic League. Each uh, uh, two-person team has been allocated uh, 30 minutes, and we look forward to a substantive uh, presentation and uh, discussion. Welcome. Take your time to get comfortable, and then we will uh, start off with, um, I believe, Mr. Myers' uh, and Mr. Stangle first, when you're ready. Please, Mr. Myers and okay. Mr. Stengel. Okay. I will start, I guess. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm a finance professor at MIT, and I, as you know, I've submitted a couple of statements on the CAPM and uh, how it is proposed to be used here. <coughs> uh, so let's go right to the chase. If you are going to use the CAPM, the main issues are the beta and the market risk premium. Uh, okay. So I've got a couple of plots. Let's take a look at the betas. We could. I think it. I thought it was going to pop up in the screen. I've got it on the screen here. I'm sorry. Thought we were all set. <laughs> the best laid plans. Okay. Let's do the market risk premium first. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, market risk premium. Let me try to summarize. Where I, where I stand on this and what I'd recommend for the board. Uh, in order to get the market risk premium, you've got to start with historical evidence. Uh, the standard practice starts with uh, data going back to 1926 from Ibbotson SBBI, because 1926 is where the good data started. Uh, that gives you about 7% as a market risk premium over long-term bonds, 20-year bonds. Now. Over, that was the standard practice going back into the 1980s, early 1990s. And over time, concerns accumulated that those uh, averages from 1926 were too high. And particularly as we rode through the boom of the late 1990s and those uh, 1926, those averages that started in 1926 kept creeping up and up and up. The thought was that those averages could not be uh, repeated in the future. And that, that, that intuition was particularly strong if you were standing at the peak of the market, let's say, in 1999 or 2000. So then the question is, how would you adjust those long-term averages if you believed that they were too high looking forward? And there's basically two ways to do it. Uh, the Ibbotson SBBI uh, data source uh, actually proposes an adjustment of the following sort. They note that uh, part of the cumulative return over that long period of time comes from an upward trend in the price-earnings ratio. That is not from growth in earnings, not from uh, dividends, but from a change in the pricing in the market. It turns out that that change in pricing over a long period, 26, 1926 to date, contributes about, uh, about uh, 0.6 to 0.7 percent to the cumulative return. And so Ibbotson SBBI says, well, let's take that out. And I think that's a sensible adjustment. That would take you down to about six point mid sixes. The other reaction to, let's say, questions about the Ibbotson series from 1926 is, well, maybe the, maybe the United States was just had good luck compared to other countries. Or maybe there was something about 1926 which uh, was a low starting point and gave you a high number. So there's been some serious research getting data for other countries and taking 
all of the data series back to 1900. Okay, if you do that for the, for the U.S., uh, it again takes your market risk premium down to about six, mid-sixes. And by the way, the U.S. is pretty much in the center of the pack. It doesn't have an unusually high market risk premium historically compared to other developed countries. So my view is that the Commission could set a range of the market risk premium is somewhere between five and seven. I say mid-sixes, but I say five because there's other financial research which argues that numbers below six might be better going forward. We can talk about that other research at some other time. There's not, it's not much reflected in the record in this case. So I say in the market risk premium five to seven. Now let's look at the betas. Uh, here are monthly betas uh, for uh, the ma four major railroads plotted over, I can't read it myself, 10 to 15 years. Uh, they're coming up now to about 0.8 and more recently to pretty close to 1 in the very latest data. And these are five-year monthly returns. They're rolling uh, in the sense that each point on that chart shows you the beta you would get looking at the monthly returns over the previous five years. I also checked to get weekly betas. And I was interested to find for this industry, which has four big actively traded companies, that the weekly series is smoother and it has much tighter standard errors, much tighter accuracy, statistical accuracy. So I recommend the Commission consider weekly betas, or betas weight based on weekly rates of return here, as well as monthly. I know there's a concern that using just five years monthly data, as is customary in this business, would leave too much noise in the beta estimates and therefore uh, not give good forecasts. My recommendation, however, is if you're worried about the noise in the monthly, in the betas based on the monthly data, rather than taking a longer period of monthly returns, just switch to weekly. Because you can cut the weekly, the noise, noise down substantially by doing, going to weekly returns. And if you go to weekly returns, you can do five years and get away from the problem that a 10-year period now would reach back into the 1998 to 2003 period where the normal relationships, where normal betas for industries of this type were all screwed up compared to what happened previously and what happened later. So if you take a, a range of betas, let's say I, I gave an example in my reply statement of uh, something like 0.85 to 1.05, and a range of uh, market risk premiums, let's say from 5 to 7, you get a range for the cost of capital. I think it would be a good thing for the Commission to explicitly state a range, rather than to leave the impression that the CAPM is something where you turn a crank and just come out with one number. If you can set a range, then the question, of course, is where do you want to be in the range? I don't think you want to be at the bottom of it. You want to be at the heart of it. And in fact, I would argue that uh, it would be better to be, it would be safer, I should say, to be above the midpoint of the range than below. Uh, you're not going to get it right. No human being can know the cost of capital precisely. And therefore, as a policy matter, I would think that you would want to weigh the cost of getting the number too low against the cost of getting the number too high. My view is that the cost of getting it too low are greater than the cost of getting it too high if you're seriously concerned about making sure that adequate capex capital investment goes into this industry. Now. Um, I gave some examples in my testimony of uh, what I would consider standard practice of getting the cost of capital from the CAPM. I come out around 11 percent, but I recognize that some people could argue for somewhat higher numbers, some, some, some could argue for somewhat lower numbers, and that's why we have the range to make it explicit what, the, what a reasonable difference of opinion could be. But I repeat, I don't think the Commission wants to be at the bottom of a reasonable range. Uh, the bottom of a reasonable range is not a reasonable place to be, as I said in my reply statement. Now, if you have this inevitable imprecision uh, in getting the cost of capital, I think you should want to, I think other things equal, you should follow standard practice, and that's what I've tried to recommend. But given the imprecision, it makes sense to turn to other um, sources of information. And the natural one is the multi-stage DCF. 
I did not tackle the task of coming up with a good multi-stage DCF. I wasn't asked to and I didn't have time. So I hope what I say now will not be read as a negative uh, statement. But I must say that I don't think the record on the multi-stage DCF is ready uh, or well enough prepared for you, the commissioners, to, to pick the best one or to pick the right one. Uh, your notice of proposed rulemaking did have a three-stage DCF in it, but uh, it, it had some spreadsheet errors. It used a long-run GDP growth rate, which was one of the lowest of the normal candidates. And it, frankly, had some arbitrary choices about the length of the first growth stage. Um, so I view that model that was put forth in the notice as an example of how one might do a multi-stage DCF and not the best way to do it. In order to figure, let me try to be more positive. How would you know when you got a multi-stage DCF that made sense? Well, it's obviously got to make arithmetic sense, but it seems to me that it has to handle or address three issues. It has to be fit to the facts of the industry. And the facts of the industry include <coughs> the large capital expenditures that the industry is facing. I believe or understand that the growth in the industry is going to be driven by capital expenditure growth and not just by increasing profitability. If that's the case, we have to ask how long will growth driven by capital expenditures in this industry last? Will it be five years? Will it be ten years? Or will it be five with some tapering off as capacity catches up with demand or new capital investment solves the problems that have been noted? That's a question that can be addressed on the facts of this industry. And it seems to me that those facts ought to be set out before we arbitrarily decide, oh, five years for the first stage, or seven years for the first stage, or 20 years for the first stage. Second, um, the model has to deal with this issue of payout to investors, which increasingly comes not as cash dividends, but as stock repurchases. The standard DCF models you've seen so far just look at dividends and assume that the payout ratio of dividends versus earnings is constant over time. That's not likely to be true. Third, uh, the model has to worry about, well, I've already hinted at this, it has to worry about changes in the payout ratio over time. Let's suppose that growth is driven by capital investment. In a period of heavy capital investment, you get rapid expansion of the assets, but also low payout, because the money has to be plowed back in order to expand. But if, as, if and as the growth slows down, payout can increase. And the increased payout adds to the return, eventually, that the investors get out of the business. If you run a model that assumes that today's relatively low payouts and relatively low dividend yields uh, uh, continue in perpetuity, you're going to understate the return that the investors can get out of the, get out of the stuff. So these are, the, I think, the three criteria that a discounted cash flow model needs to cover. It needs to handle growth from investment. It needs to worry about total payout, and not just dividends. And it needs to track how payout is likely to change over time. I put these forwards as criticisms of the model that uh, was presented in the notice, but they also apply to the model that uh, Mr. Crowley has, and Mr. Fapp have put forward in their reply, reply statements. OK. Um, let's see. I think I will stop there and turn it over to Bruce Stangle, who I know has also thought about these discounted cash flow models. I did touch on capital structure issues and some other topics in my reply statement, but I'll leave those, and if they come up later, I'll address them then. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here again uh, since last uh, February. Uh, my co-author, Dean Hubbard, uh, sends his regrets, but he had a long-standing commitment at Columbia University today and couldn't be here. For me, it's a special honor also to be here on this panel with uh, Professor Myers, who was my finance professor when I was a graduate student at MIT. So pleased to be here in that regard, too. I wanted to make two just general observations initially. Uh, first, uh, Dean Hubbard and I 
do not think that the board actually needs to be making de novo calculations of the inputs to either a DCF or a CAPM model. These sorts of uh, data are available from reputable financial providers, and the board could use one of them um, to save yourselves a lot of work. Uh, the process would be more straightforward and efficient as a result. Uh, in particular, we recommend you, that you look at the Ibbotson Associates uh, data that uh, Professor Myers just referred to. It's typically reliable, sensible, and well-documented. Um, second, as we've noted in our uh, written statements, uh, finance theory does not really tell you what the right answer is, and that's why we've recommended that you adopt two approaches. And, Chairman Nottingham referred to uh, both of them, uh, but neither one is going to give you the right answer necessarily. So we suggest you use two and uh, use them as cross-checks on each other. On the market risk premium, um, our suggestion is that you look at the so-called long horizon market risk premium estimate that's calculated annually by the Ibbotson Associates. That's the S&P index from 1926 forward. Um, recent, there's a recent book out by uh, Nobel winner Edward Prescott who described the period from 1926 to the present as, quote, the golden age with regard to accurate financial data. In contrast, uh, the board up to now has been advocating the use of a 50-year time horizon, which I think is uh, not correct and uh, is actually an arbitrary period. I have an exhibit to uh, illustrate this point. Um, if you can see that, the uh, leftmost column is the 81-year uh, period that starts from 1926 through 2006. The fourth bar to the right of that is the 50-year period that the board has apparently uh, endorsed. That is a 5.2% market risk premium. And I, I believe that's too low, and for, it's too low for a couple of reasons. Uh, Primarily, that includes the years of 1973 and 74 uh, oil embargo, if you remember the gas lines. Uh, those two years alone were minus 21 percent and minus 34 percent, respectively, for the annual equity risk premium in those two years. And um, when you take a longer uh, picture, uh, 81 years, the effect of those is dampened. Uh, the Ibbotson Associates, in defending why uh, they start from 1926, uh, says the following. Without an appreciation of the 1920s and 30s, no one would believe that such events could happen. The 81-year period, starting with tw 1926, is representative of what can happen. It includes high and low returns, volatile and quiet markets, war and peace, inflation and deflation, and prosperity and depression. Restricting attention to a shorter historical period underestimates the amount of change that occur, could occur in a long future period. Another reason to uh, why I think uh, the 50-year period is not reasonable is offered by Professor Stephen Penman of Columbia University. He, summon, he has summarized the possible range of market risk premia as going between 4.5% and 9.2%, slightly wider than Professor Myers. And he says it's virtually a crapshoot as to what number is the right one in there. But again, note that the board's uh, number of 5.2 is at the very low end of that range uh, offered by Professor Penman. Uh, Ibbotson also says in defending uh, why you take a long view, uh, they say, quote, using a long series makes it less likely that the analyst can justify any number he or she wants. On the issue of beta, um, I believe five years or less is the right way to think about that. And I have a second exhibit here, which unfortunately doesn't, it's not very easy to see. But what it, what it is, is it's a series of beta estimates for a five-year period using either monthly or weekly data, a three-year period or a two-year period. And what the data show there are that, um, just as Professor Myers had indicated earlier, 
the, the precision you get when you use weekly data is, is much greater. The standard errors are lower. And uh, it also indicates that beta has probably increased uh, over time, to, uh, looking at the present. And that um, you could use weekly data and get a much more precise uh, answer. Uh, the board has expressed some concern about undue volatility if they depart from a 10-year estimation period. And frankly, I don't think this is the, that's quite the right uh, way to think about it. I think uh, beta actually is a measure of volatility. So why be afraid of measuring volatility? Let's embrace it and let's pursue accuracy by having tighter standard errors. On the issue of uh, a multi-stage DCF, uh, there was a question uh, that the board put out about uh, a 10-year phase-down period proposed by the, uh, the Coal League. Uh, I have some concern about that proposal. Uh, in fact, I would offer as an alternative that the board consider the Ibbotson approach. They have a multi-stage DCF, which they publish in their uh, annual book. It's called the Cost of Capital Yearbook. And there's a page in there for the railroad industry. And they show for 2007 uh, a three-stage uh, DCF yielding 11.4 cost of capital, cost of equity capital. To me, that's a better approach to take than uh, the other estimates that I've seen in the record, either proposed by, the, uh, by Mr. Crowley and FAP or uh, the board's own uh, DCF model. Um, Professor Myers in his testimony pointed out that the board's uh, DCF model had committed uh, the cardinal sin, at least, of double discounting. When you correct for that, rather than a 7.2% um, cost of cap capital, Professor Myers indicated that you would get a 9.8% cost of capital, uh, cost of equity. In addition, if you correct for the effect of buybacks, because uh, investors would get uh, stock price appreciation, that number goes to 11.83%. And I think uh, Mr. Motes is going to refer to this later in his summary. But um, the DCF models that are in the record, I think, are unduly low, seriously flawed, and yield biased estimates. And that's why uh, we suggest you consider using the Ibbotson model. It's right there in the book. It has a uh, reasonable approach. And I think it's worthy of consideration. And uh, I think I will stop there, unless there are questions. Thank you. We'll now turn to uh, Mr. Crowley and Mr. Hodder. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Tom Crowley. I'm with 